course, the world is not running out of oil. There's 165 billion barrels of the stuff trapped in the Athabasca tar sands. And if we suck that dry, there's about 513 barrels of the stuff under the steaming jungles of Amazonia in the Orinoco tar sands in Venezuela. And if we go through that, I suppose there's even billions more of oil trapped in shales, Colorado, Wyoming, indeed all throughout the world. But what the world has run out of is the oil that you can afford to burn. Because the very prices that are going to be needed to take oil out of tar sands, and not only take oil out of tar sands, but have tar sands replace the Middle East as the source of tomorrow's supply, are the very same prices that are going to take you right off the road. And that's, of course, exactly what happened last year in the United States, where over four million drivers took the exit lane for the first time during the post-war period. There will probably be another 40 million drivers who will follow them over the next decade. I say uh, too expensive to burn because 60% of all the oil that we do burn around the world is burned as a transit fuel, for which really there is no substitute. But not only will the oil prices of tomorrow be too expensive to fill up your car in, but they will be too expensive to lubricate and operate a global economy. Globalization is just a fancy word for a very simple process. Move your factory, or even better, get right out of the factory business altogether and buy whatever your factory used to make from someplace halfway around the world where the labor is a whole lot cheaper. That's why when you go into a big box store and look at any of the goods that you're going to buy, none of them are made remotely close to where you live. Increasingly, that story is the same when you even go into a supermarket to buy food. But while the whole idea of a global economy is really based on wage arbitrage, that means trading jobs for where wages are high, to trade in jobs to where wages are low. There is one implicit assumption, and that implicit assumption is that the cost of moving things, not just the cost of moving the final product, but the cost of moving all those intermediate inputs around the world can be done at marginal expense. So that really the sole determining determinant of economic geography of where we put things is really the cost of labor. And that's true in a world of $20 a barrel oil. But that is not true in a world of triple-digit oil prices. Because in a world of triple-digit oil prices, what we're going to find is to buy your food, to buy your steel, to buy your furniture from somewhere made halfway around the world is penny-wise and pound-foolish because what you will save on labor costs, you will more than squander on bunker fuel. You see, no matter how we move those goods around the world, whether we move them by air, whether we move them by ship, whether we move them by truck, whether we move them by rail, there's only one fuel that we use, and that fuel is oil. And there's no substitute for that. We can substitute many things for oil. We don't have to burn oil to generate electricity, although there are still many people in the world who do that. We don't need to burn oil to, for home heating, although there are still homes in North America that do that as well. And we don't need oil to be a feedstock to make petrochemicals. We can substitute that with natural gas. The problem is that right now there is no substitute for oil as a transport fuel. And I'm sure in the fullness of time, if you give us 10 to 15 years, technology will develop and we will develop substitutes for oil as a transport fuel. Unfortunately, 
Our rendezvous with triple-digit oil prices is not in 10 or 15 years. Our rendezvous with triple-digit oil prices is in 10 or 15 months. And the adjustment is not going to be developing new technologies that lessen our dependence on oil. The adjustment is going to be find a way of running our economy with using a lot less oil. We're going to find that just at the same time that it takes triple-digit oil prices to bring forth tomorrow's supply because yesterday's supply of cheap conventional oil is all but burnt. Just as that is occurring, the world has never been thirstier for the stuff. While triple-digit oil prices has certainly tamed North America's demand for oil and Western Europe's demand for oil, that's not where today's demand is coming from, and more importantly, that's not where tomorrow's demand is coming from. Last year, OPEC, the very organization that you expect will furnish you with your oil supply of the future, consumed 10.5 million barrels a day. Throw in two non-OPEC producers, Mexico and Russia, they consumed 14.5 million barrels a day. Two Chinas. What makes OPEC so thirsty for its fuel? Well, I'll tell you what makes OPEC so thirsty for its fuel. It's 25 cent a gallon gasoline, and more importantly, 7 cents a gallon bunker fuel, which is what they burn to generate electricity in the Middle East. So while everybody's focused on how much spare capacity OPEC has, the real issue is how much of OPEC's own production is it consuming itself? Every year, that answer is more and more. Every year, it has less and less to export. And when we look around in the rest of the world, we find that for those four million Americans who took the exit lane last year, unfortunately, there are 10 people for everyone who took the exit lane waiting to get on. That while General Motors, which gratefully received $14.5 billion from the Canadian taxpayer and $40 billion from the U.S. taxpayer, while they're still waiting for North American sales to recover, their sales in China are already up over 65%. It is now the Chinas and Russias and Brazils, that is tomorrow's auto market. Where does a world like that go? Was triple-digit oil prices a speculative peak? Or was the triple-digit oil prices that we saw in 2008 a peak in our future? I believe that future is right around the corner. What it may hold, however, is open for debate. Just exactly how did we get to where we are coming out in the deepest post-war recession, facing the largest budget deficits in history? Was that all about a whole bunch of unsold properties and places like Cleveland? that were securitized by, by uh, subprime mortgages and that were then held on bank balance sheets and fancy derivative instruments. If you listen to the pundits, what we really saw was a financial crisis. 